sorry to disappoint you, but I won't read the code because we've run out of time. <laughs> And there's a few people who've read it already, so they probably don't want to hear it again. So what I'm going to talk about, which is really brief, and it has been mentioned a couple of times already, is three things. The why. Why do we need to understand environmental footprinting of the products we make? Um, the legal landscape. And finally, to introduce you to the FIFA Code of Practice. So the why is, if we don't know the envir environmental footprint of the product that we produce, we won't know how to develop strategies to improve it. So, okay, there's going to be a marketing game in this environmental footprint, but there also is an efficiency. So Jim mentioned earlier about there's an efficiency. So there is an efficiency um, targets that we can achieve if we know where we are at the moment. Because Im improving your environmental footprint <coughs> shouldn't be about increasing costs. If you're doing it right, it will be reducing costs. But if we don't know where we are, we won't be able to improve. So we need it as an industry to develop strategies to improve our environmental footprint and become more efficient. We also need it to answer questions from farmers, which people might think they're not interested now, but they will become more and more interested. And Alex mentioned the cap and you've got the Tesco's. People will come and asking questions and the farmer will ask us questions. And also, thirdly, people mentioned earlier about let's get this one number for Ireland, let's just get one number from Northern Ireland, but we're in a business. People will want to differentiate themselves from competitors. So some people might say, oh, I'm delighted with that one number, but then you will have the more forward-thinking, more business-driven um, companies, and they want to differentiate themselves. They want to get credit for the work that they're doing to improve their environmental footprint. So... The farmer is going to be like ourselves. The farmer is going to want to know their number and feed obviously impacts their number because they'll also want to know how can I improve it. And people earlier have said the biggest game in this is not about the number that you have. It's about the number you have next year. How are you going to improve it? Um, and also the farmer will need to be able to communicate his environmental footprint to his downstream customer, which will be the processors. And the downstream partners will want to communicate to the consumer. The next generation, the generation after that, are going to become more and more interested in environmental footprint. So that's the why. So then we've got the legal landscape. So what are we looking at in terms of um, the legality of this? Can I just make a feed and can I take an ad in the paper and say I've got the lowest carbon footprint feed? Um, you know, where's the legal landscape at the moment? And what are the EU Commission saying? So at the moment, the EU Commission recognises that it's difficult for consumers, companies, market actors to actually make sense of environmental labels. Like we saw the label earlier from Tesco, you know, can people make sense of where those figures came from? And the EU Commission recognises that people have difficulty making sense of that. And the EU Commission is also aware that there are some good available methods and initiatives, but there are some bad methods and initiatives. Um, they're also you know, have noted the EU Commission that there's a worry about greenwashing. And greenwashing is companies giving a false impression of their environmental impact or their benefit. You know, somebody might say I have this product and it has no environmental impact. And somebody might say I have this product and actually benefits you from an environmental point of view. And they're concerned that when people come out with these messages that they cannot be misleading. The Commission also says that greenwashing misleads the market actors and the problem with that is it doesn't give due advantage to the people who are actually doing a good job. So they want to encourage people to do a good job so they don't want greenwashing. And finally, if you've got all this greenwashing, you're actually doing a disservice to the green economy. So what's the outlook? So, in the, so legislation, and I think particularly on the food side, um, do we have that concrete legislation on green labelling at the moment, you know, to monitor the label that was produced there earlier? Well, the EU Commission in the circular economy package in that includes a proposal for a directive to substantiate green claims with the PEF method. It was mentioned last year it was meant to come. I'm not quite sure if it was the year before it was meant to come as well. I think it was. Um, and now they're saying March 2023. Um, there's also the Sustainable Food System Framework Initiative, and in that sustainable, fo the sustainable food labelling is a key pillar, which supposedly will include the LCA and non-LCA-based sustainability information, and that is foreseen for quarter three, 2023. 
And finally, people around the room, especially people working with Nutreco or Charo and Premix companies, but everybody re really, were all using feed additives. And they were seen for a while as the panacea of what was going to solve all our problems. And I presume everybody saw in the last few days that we can all sit back or we will be able to sit back when Bill Gates um, develops the, it's not an additive, it's actually feed material, or it probably will be an additive and they'll take the seaweed and they'll take the additive from the seaweed. And hopefully he'll be giving me a ring to ask me, how is he going to make those claims? <laughs> and I mightn't be here next year. So um, the feed additive legislation is going to integrate sustainability functions and claims within the guidelines for justification. Again, it's got a timeline for quarter four, 2023. But those timelines, I've seen them over the years. I'm in the industry, they move. 10 years is nothing when it comes to regulations. But in the feed industry, we're not working in a vacuum. We're not waiting for those regulations. We actually have regulation, which anybody in this room who does formulations or labels or has anything to do with um, uh, basically formulating a diet is aware that we're already adhering to a regulation 767-2009. So that came out in 2009, took a few years to embed into the industry. But now that's our Bible, that's our law, that's our code, that's, that's our laws. We are bound to operate under that. And that regulation basically tells us about placing on the market and use of feed. And in that regulation, we talk about claims. And that regulation, so we can't, so we already have rules that we're governed under, laws, and we have to abide by them. When we start coming up with our environmental footprint, we need to be able to substantiate the information that we're putting on our, that is in our labelling. And there's an article in it, Article 5 says, the person responsible for the labelling of feed shall make available to the competent authority any information concerning the claimed properties of the feed. So if you're making a green claim, it's a voluntary claim, but you have to be able to substantiate that. And you have to be able to substantiate before you make it, not after the effect. Um, so then Article 11 also, just those four key words, we must not mislead the user. So we're bound not to mislead the user. Article 13 has basic criteria and requirements related to claims. I'm going to skip that sentence and come back to it. So I'm basically saying to you, we do have laws already in the, food in, in the feed industry that govern what we do in relation to environmental footprint that we're going to say we need to be able to substantiate it. And then people will say, I'm not going to put anything on my label. I'm actually just going to put it on my website. Well, in that regulation, it tells you what labelling is. And labelling isn't just the label you put in your bag. Labelling is your ad in the paper. Labelling is a document, a ring, a collar, the internet. Labelling is what you, it's, it's, it's everything. Um, and that's clearly defined in that regulation. And there's also information on what a claim is in the regulation. So that regulation came out in 2009. And our good colleagues in FIFAC, which is the European Manufacturers Association, which IGFA is a member of and sits on lots of the committees, they developed a code of practice to help people understand that regulation. I started in the industry in 1993, pre-feed hygiene regulation. And since then, like every day is a school day, and now we've got on another train, and now we're on the environmental, and I have to keep learning and learning. But when that code of practice, and I was doing labels, and I had the legislation, and I, it's so difficult to read reg regulation, and um, you'd read it once, and you'd read one thing, you'd read it again, and you'd read something else, and you'd wonder how you missed that word. So the FIFA code of practice on labeling, which was developed by industry experts, um, helped me greatly in my job to actually know that I was doing the labeling correctly. Lots of examples in the back of it, which were really helpful. And also it made me, I worked in an export business, know that this was a code that was being used in Germany and France and other countries because it was um, developed by a European Manufacturers Association. So in the back of that um, code, there's already a section on claims. Okay, so that brings me to what I'm here to talk about, and sadly no time to read it, um, is FIFAC set up. A, so in the... 767-2009, there are two articles that actually encourage industry to come up with codes of practice to sit beside the regulation. 
and um, FIFAC have now set up, or in 2021, set up a task force called the Green Labelling Task Force, and their job is to actually develop a code which will sit in the um, labelling code of practice to help people with developing, with using GFLI, using the PEF methodology and um, producing green labels. So that code of practice and also FIFEC said, let's not wait for the regulation. Let's be involved in trying to shape the further regulation that's coming down track. It was set up in May 2021 and had our first meeting in June 2021. And who's on that task force? So there's representatives from all the European member states. And that's very good for Ireland because we're kind of a bit behind in some ways. And there are countries who are ahead. So we get to sit, sit and listen to the task force and it's driving us on. Um, and because there are countries who are ahead with this. So you've experts from the different associations and um, I sit as part of the Irish representing the IGFA on that association. What work has been done? Um, well, they have developed a code of practice. So the code of practice has been developed. Um, it's on to draft six. Um, draft six, it was draft five. Um, is it, I, I've read up to draft five. So <laughs> draft six is now, I think, hot off the press. And draft five, I think, was sent to stakeholders and to competent authorities, because it's very important, and I know there's people from the competent authority here today, they're going to be the people that you're going to have to justify these claims to. So it's important that they understand how you're coming up with these claims, because it's a learning curve for them as well. It's a journey for everybody. So there's still a lot to do, lots of feedback with the document. And I'm sure, Jim, you had lots of feedback on it. Um, and we are aware on the task force that there's a lot to do, but the hope is that we will have a document that we will then send to SCOPAF, and they're the people from member states, and they will make the decisions and they will help shape the regulation that's coming. And that's basically it.